Chemistry lecture number 62, States of Matter. Most of the time, matter exists as a solid, liquid, or gas. Solids maintain the same shape and volume. So, for example, I have a coin here, and I can move it around and hit it, and it still keeps the uh, same shape, and it takes up the same amount of space. Uh, liquids maintain the same shape, I'm sorry, it's the same volume, but changes shape to fit the container it occupies. So, by way of example, here I have a liquid, and it's in a round-shaped container. But if I transfer it to a square-shaped container, it takes more of a square shape. Um, but the uh, amount of space that the liquid takes up doesn't change. So the volume remains the same, but the shape changes. And then a gas uh, changes shape to fit the container it occupies. And gases will expand or contract to match the volume of its container. Now, <clears throat> in a solid, particles are packed very close together. If a solid is a pure substance, the atoms, molecules, or ions will be arranged in an orderly pattern and form a crystal. So a pure substance would be like an element or a compound like salt or sugar. Uh, if you have mixtures of different uh, molecules and uh, atoms, then it won't form a crystal. But if you have a pure substance like pure salt, pure sugar, uh, the uh, molecules or ions or atoms will uh, form a nice orderly pattern. Okay. So, particles in a pure solid are arranged in an orderly pattern. Now, particles in a solid move in a straight line, but they collide immediately with another particle. A particle in a solid appears to vibrate around a fixed point. Since the particles can barely move, the collection of particles maintain the same shape and volume. So, the particles in a solid do move, but what happens is, um, they just appear to uh, vibrate back and forth. And the other particles are so close to it that they don't get very far, okay? So it appears as though they vibrate around, you know, like the center or a fixed point. Mm -hmm. So since the particles can barely move, the collection of particles maintain the same shape and volume. Now, a liquid, on the other hand, uh, the particles are far enough apart to slip past each other <clears throat> but they're still close enough for collision with another particle to occur uh, very quickly. So, particles in a liquid have enough space to slip past each other, but they're still very close to each other. So the particles in a liquid, you know, they can slide around and move, but as they move around, um, they immediately collide with uh, other uh, particles in the uh, solution. All right, so particles in a liquid can move because there's more space, but collisions still occur quite frequently, and they're still close enough together so that the uh, volume doesn't change. Particles in a liquid move in straight lines, but collisions occur so quickly, they appear to vibrate around a moving point. So let me sort of explain what we mean by vibrating around a moving point. I believe the way they observe this is they take... Uh, particles of pollen that you can see under a microscope, and they watch the movement of the pollen. Um, so <clears throat> the particle of the pollen would appear, to say, move from here to here, but as it moves from here to here, it vibrates. So it would be, you know, vibrating like that. So the net movement, it uh, is like this. So this is a single point that's moving like that, and then about this moving point, the particle moves around the moving point. At least that's how it appears. So the path of the moving point is drawn in red. Uh, the squiggly green line represents the vibration of the particle around the red line or the moving point. In a gas, the particles are far apart, moving rapidly in a straight line. Particles change direction when they collide with other particles or collide with the container wall. So. If you have a container that has a gas, particles in the gas are far apart and moving rapidly, and the characteristic of particles in a gas is they move in a straight line and they only change direction when they collide into something. Alright, so they move in a straight line, but they only change direction when they collide with the wall of the container or 
with another gas particle. Overall, movement determines if a substance exists as a solid, liquid, or gas. If a particle moves, it has kinetic energy. Temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. At high temperatures, particles are moving fast. At low temperatures, particles are moving slowly. Temperature is measured in degrees Celsius or degrees Kelvin. And in the United States, we use degrees Fahrenheit, but uh, in Europe, that's what they use uh, to measure uh, temperature. And then in science, we often use Kelvin to do our calculations. Two different ways of measuring it. At zero degrees Kelvin, all particle movement stops. This is the complete absence of kinetic energy. It's referred to as absolute zero. Uh, to convert Celsius temperature into Kelvins, we use this formula. So if it's 20 degrees Celsius to get the temperature in Kelvin, you just take the 20 degrees Celsius, add 273, and that would give you, what, 293? So that would give you the uh, temperature in Kelvin. And we'll do more of this later, but just for now, this is just to get you familiar with the idea that there are two different scientific ways of measuring temperature. In general, substances at low temperatures will be solids. At higher temperatures, they will exist at liquids. And at even higher temperatures, they will exist as a gas. The temperature of a substance determines if the substance was a solid, liquid, or gas. The atmospheric pressure surrounding a substance also influences the physical state of a substance. Atmospheric pressure is the collision of gas atoms or molecules against a surface. So here we have some solid object and what's happening is these little circles here represent gas atoms or gas molecules. <coughs> so this is like sitting out in the open air. As it sits out in the open air, the air molecules or atoms collide against the surface of the solid and bounce off of it. Okay. So atmospheric pressure is just uh, the collision of gas atoms or molecules against a surface. So right now, um, your skin is experiencing atmospheric pressure. There are uh, gas molecules bouncing off against your skin and you are experiencing atmospheric pressure. If a surface gets lots of collisions from surrounding gas molecules, it's under high pressure. Substances under high pressure tend to be solids. At lower pressure, substances tend to exist as liquids or gases. Pressure is measured in kilopascals, uh, or millimeters of mercury, or atmospheres. So you just have to be familiar that there are three ways of measuring atmospheric pressure. And on an average day, uh, the atmospheric pressure is 101.325 kilopascals, or 760 millimeters of mercury, or one, atom of, one atmosphere of pressure. So all three of these are the same measurement. Uh, 760 millimeters of mercury is the same as one atmosphere of pressure, or one atmosphere of pressure is the same as 101.325 kilopascals of air pressure. So um, when you uh, measure the pressure in your tire, they use pounds of pressure. Well, <coughs> in chemistry, this is how we measure pressure of a gas or atmospheric pressure. Right? And we'll get back to this later. So just to be familiar that we measure the air pressure around us uh, in units of kilopascals, millimeters of mercury, or atmospheres of pressure. And by the way, another way of, instead of saying millimeters of mercury, sometimes they say tors. All right, so that's just another thing you have to be familiar with. But that's how things work in science. You have to be familiar with the terminology. For a PDF transcript of this lecture, go to www.richardlouis.com. This has been chemistry lecture number 62, States of Matter.